Amen. That's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Did you get one of these blue cards when you came in this morning? If you did not, hold your hand up. We have 15,000 ushers ready to rush at your disposal. At least one who runs fast on one bad knee. Keep it up just for a moment. Where's my other guy? Over here, Bill. Keep it just for a moment. Hi, Alan. How you doing? Grab one of these cards. And while they're finishing distributing, leave your hand up till they find you. They'll get you one. This is very important. I know it doesn't look real pretty. It's not anything spectacular. It doesn't have any flyer prints on it. It doesn't even say Happy Mother's Day. But this is a prayer reminder. In just several weeks, we'll be going to Belize, not too far away. About a month away, we'll be going to Belize, and there we're going to be participating in all that work that God has for us to do there. The crusade, the school assemblies, the, the uh, citywide youth rally. There's just a lot that's going on. We'll be in every kind of place we can get imaginable into. We need you to be praying. Belmopan is the capital city of Belize. If we can shake this city for Jesus, you just never know what's going to happen. Amen? And I believe we can. On the one side of the card is the list of everybody that's going on that trip so far as we know of. Still not too late if you decide you're going, get, it, get on board quick. But I'm asking you to take this blue card and fold just like I did that one right down the middle. And it becomes a little prayer tent. You can put that on your table at home or wherever y'all gather, the breakfast nook, whatever's going on. And at least once a day, take time to pray. If you don't have time to pray for everybody on that list each day, break it down into groups of four or five people. And start praying now for these people. Start praying now for this city. Pray that God will break the forces of hell that hold it in captivity. That God will bless these people that are going. There's a lot of things we're doing from women's Bible studies to youth rallies to crusade services to Sunday services, uh, school, school meetings, all kinds of stuff. What's going to make this successful is not just those people going, but those who will stay behind and pray for those that are going. There's nothing more powerful than your prayer and your faith. Nothing in all the world. I had a guy tell him about all the problems he was facing. I said, I got, I got a solution for your problems. The two words, prayer and faith, you know, prayer and faith. Nothing, can do, nothing in this universe is greater than that. God's given us all authority in prayer and faith. We believe God, we pray according to his will, and I want you to know demons tremble. Yes. Amen? Yes. That's the kind of power we have. So I, I really can't encourage you enough to take the opportunity to put that in a place where you'll see it daily and pray, and when you finish that, pray some more. Amen? But I believe God's a big God. Also, my wife's not in here right now, but be sure and... Uh, you know, uh, pat her on the back and tell her good job for putting up with me for 39 years. Amen. Today we celebrate our anniversary. She uh, didn't know what she got into. But we've had fun trying to figure it out. Amen. 39 years ago, that was my Mother's Day gift for my mom who's here today as well. Praise the Lord. So, uh, you know, that's the gift that's kept on giving, hasn't it? So, praise the Lord. I'm sure she might have rather had cash, but got her daughter-in-law instead. No complaints since have there been. But uh, praise the Lord for Kathy and all she does for Jesus and for this church and for our kids and for our family and for all you moms. You know, today, there's my switcher thing here. I know that may seem a little strange to be preaching a mother on Rahab the harlot on Mother's Day, you know. But we're a unique group, are we not? <laughs> People ask me all the time after they hear my Mother's Day and Father's Day sermons, Where'd you come up with that, you know? Uh, my mind works a little different than most people's, just forgive me. But bear with me, it's going somewhere. There's a reason we're doing this. In fact, we've called it the path to virtuous. The Bible talks about in Proverbs, who can find a virtuous woman. Most people do not think of Rahab in the context of virtuous. But if we'll follow her life today, you're going to see the unique movement of God in her life to bring her to that place in her life where she goes down in infamy as one of God's greats. And you, you'll see that story. And to me, it is such a hopeful message for any woman and any man that God can take us and use us and take all that junk in the closet and the past and, and, and behind us and deliver us and set us free and set us on a pathway to uh, usability and grace and glory, where God actually is moving in our hearts and in our lives. So it's a great story, I believe, and sometimes it's missed because people don't follow the story all the way through. We'll read from Joshua chapter 2 in just a moment. Before I get there, let me just set a little bit of the scenario. 
For those of you who have read the book or seen the movie, you know the children of Israel have come out of Egypt and Moses has died and Joshua is now taking over as the leader of the children of Israel. And uh, they're parked on the banks of the Jordan waiting for direction from God, waiting for time from God of when do we go in. During this particular period of time, Joshua sends out two spies. Now the difference between the spies here and those back in Numbers 13 is it wasn't followed up with a business meeting, all right? They're just going out and they're surveying the situation and they're sent out to spy the land out. 39, 40 years have gone by since they last took a look at it and especially into Jericho. So they're being sent in in this covert kind of mindset to, to check things out. And by the way, before I even get to that, let me just say this. Uh, it's been 40 years. Why are we waiting? Can we go in? All right, let's get this party started. Let's go into Jericho. But God hadn't given the marching orders just yet. And sometimes we get kind of impatient. We, we know that the Lord's working. We know that God's doing something. We know that God's leading us in place. But sometimes we, we lack patience. Just remember, you may know that God's got something on the calendar for you. The time factor is his business. All right. The moment is his business. You just be patient and you be consistent. You never know uh, what you might get out ahead of God in and get yourself in deeper trouble. You walk with God. Remember, God's not in a hurry. You may be wringing your hands. He's not. You may be stressing out. He's not. All right. So you wait on the Lord. At the same time, God has delayed his judgment upon Jericho because there's someone in Jericho that he's going to reach. Someone and their family. And sometimes we're so busy about our plans, we forget God's plans. Even if it concerns God's will for our life, there's, there's a whole lot more going on than what most of us perceive at any given time. Sometimes we're so wrapped up in our own little inner space, what we're going to do, where we're going to go, what we have plans for. We just miss the bigger picture of redemption. The God's word. There was, there was a sinner uh, that God wanted to transform into a saint in that city. And there's lots of people out there who are in sinner's clothes, but they're saints in disguise. God just hadn't reached them yet. All right. And we need to be cognizant of those people. Even what you might consider to be the social low of the low of the low scale. Yes, Rahab was a harlot, a prostitute. She had an inn. She had a place. She was, she was a, a woman of the streets. Now, I, there's some theologians that I've read commentaries about who try to take that away and say, you know, well, that's not really, she was just an innkeeper. That's what that word meant. Uh, we'll look at that in a minute, all right? But anyway, as you open scriptures with me and we look in Joshua, and uh, Catherine, do me a favor. You just follow me with the scriptures on the clicking soon. All right. Chapter two, verse one. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim, saying, go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went in and came into the house of a harlot whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Our, our spy detectors have gone off, all right? I wish we were as discerning, amen? And Satan invades our territory as the devil was. But, and the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab saying, bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, yeah, these men came to me. I didn't know where they're from. Now, yes, this is a bald faced lie, all right? Well, does God condone lying? Hey, she's lost still, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, God never condone, con condones lying, all right? So get, before you go into big theological argument, don't worry about it, she's lost. All right. And by the way, the whole thing about covert activity anyways, espionage is pretty much based on lies, is it not? We'll go on. But it came about that when it was time to shut the gate at dark, that the men went out. I do not know where, she tells them. Pursue them quickly. You can overtake them. But she had brought them on the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax, which had laid out upon the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to Jordan to the forge. And as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gates. Now we'll look at a little bit more of the story. We know it's the story of, of rescue from, from the judgment that was to come. But as it, as it happens, this woman who God gets a hold of, it's a unique story. However, and by whatever means and by whatever situations happen, these men find themselves at Rahab's inn and Rahab's house. And 
she converses with them and they converse with them. They know now, she knows who they are. They know who she is. But as you look at the whole thing, you know, it's a story of redemption. It's a story of God's great grace. But I see it even further than that. I see it as a picture of any, any person, especially in this regard of any woman, who's seeking to be what God wants them to be, who desires to be that godly woman, that godly wife, that godly mother. You look at the story of Rahab and you see the simple pieces to the puzzle put together of what it takes to get from point A to point B in that walk what it takes and what was involved in her decision to escape the judgment that was to come and the choices that she made. First of all and foremost, she was a sinner. That's where it starts. In fact, again, not an innkeeper, but a sinner, a harlot. James talks about it and refers to it as the harlot. Hebrews talks about it in 1131 and Rahab, the harlot. So let's not try to you know, paint a pretty picture. They try to say, well, you know, she's in the descendant line of the Lord Jesus, so we can't have a harlot in there. Hey, look at you, look at me. We're all sinners, you know? And, and, and Rahab may have started out different than Mary, the mother of Jesus, but we're all sinners. And we all need to be humble before God. We all need to recognize our place. And if her name is, is used, not in the proper sense, in different places in the Hebrew language in, in, in Scripture, uh, Rahab, and it's a word which actually means wide or broad in the context you know, of, of describing something. But it's also translated several times in the Bible as pride, this particular word Rahab. So the essence which we all battle with, no matter where you are in your life, is that issue of pride. All that we do really as, as sinners kind of flows from the fact of pride. It's, it's putting our lives at our own charge. We're going to lead it. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to take charge. Nobody's going to tell us what to do. You know, God's there, but I don't want him to tell him, I want to do what I want to do and I'll do what God wants me to do as long as it fits my, my, my vision, my goals. You're never going to be anything and you're never going to go anywhere in life that's going to bring any satisfaction, any fullness, any substance to your life as long as you maintain an attitude of you're in charge when it's actually Jesus, the Lord of glory, that has to be in charge of our lives if there's ever going to be any progression. By the way, out of this story you see, this one soul that the Lord's looking out after in Jericho, this one woman that, that God directs sovereignly these spies to, was a harlot. I just want you to know, this gives me an assurance that hey, God still loves sinners, amen? God loves lost people. God knows, God knows how we are in our sinful way. There is no avenue that we will not go to at some point in our life, is there? I mean, we can, we, if we're left to our own demise, if we're left to our own selves, there's no path that we won't take. Now somebody said, well, I would never do that. You never know what you would do. So here she is, and to see the beauty of this story is that God loves sinners, and you know, that's, that's the most important thing. The second thing is, is that she hears about God. In verse nine, it says, and she said unto the men, I know the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror has fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Now, if you're going into to Jericho to look for some prospects for Christians or whatever, uh, this is probably not the first place you're gonna go. But she is a woman who gets it. Perception, discernment. She looks around and sees what's really going on. She's not trying to say, hey, I can fix this. And she, no, she really gets a grip on what's happening. And by the way, if, if any of us are ever gonna walk with God, it always comes, faith comes by what? By hearing. She said, I've heard what's going on here. I know what's getting ready. There's a judgment coming and everybody here is afraid of what's getting ready to happen. She hears the report. I want you to know the gospel in itself uh, is, is bad news and good news. It's bad news in the context that judgment is coming, all right? That life without God is not just hopeless now, it's hopeless forever. It's just no, no, no glory in life. There's no joy in life without God. She, she gets this report. We've heard about the sovereign God. The third thing is, is this, that she, she believes the report and you can tell it by her confession she re believes that report. She says in verse 11, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts didn't melt. We believe that there's this God in heaven and he's gonna judge those on the earth. And you know, I mean, she's not like that group who'd just kind of been wandering around the, in the wilderness for 39 years. They saw the miracles of God and their heart was still filled with unbelief. She just heard about it. That's why the Bible says blessed, more blessed are those who hear it who hadn't seen it. 
Those disciples, they saw him, they touched him, they handled him, they were with him every day. You and I, it's a whole different story for us. We walk by faith, not by sight. And she is that, in that same instance, the same as we are. She has to believe a report. She hadn't seen the miracles. She's heard a story. And she, she confesses in her faith, by her faith confession there, that Jehovah is the true God. And she owned up to those people as being the people of God, which is required of all of us, by the way. We have to own up to the fact that Jehovah, Lord God, he is God, and there is no other. That Jesus is Lord. The fourth thing, she believed that this judgment was coming which leads her at this point to believe that, that a choice has to be made. She's got to do something because judgment, she's got to do something on at least behalf of her family. Will you spare my family? She's going to have to make this decision based on what she understands. All too often in life, we know what God wants and we base our decision on everything but what God wants. We make foolish decisions. We make selfish decisions. We make determination. I mean, for those of you who are graduating as our seniors in, in, in this fellowship, there's going to be lots of decisions, more than you've ever had to make on your own behalf. You're not going to have mom and dad to continually threaten you for righteousness. <laughs> You're going to have to make some real decisions. You can be like early Rahab, make dumb decisions, lead you to dumb places, live a stupid life. All right? Or you can make righteous decisions, Wise decisions which lead to fullness of life. Well, Rahab is making the first, probably best and greatest decision she's ever made at this point to understand that Jehovah is sovereign God to the point she's even willing to lay down her life for her own family. She's willing to risk her life to save the spies. It says by faith in Hebrews 11, by faith Rahab the harlot perished not with them that were disobedient because she received the spies with peace. She didn't tell on them, she didn't reject them, she received them and she hid them. She made some choices, hard choices. Risky, risky decisions. These are not easy choices. As a woman, as a mother, whether you realize it or not, we are, you are often called to make difficult, hard, and risky decisions. Some decisions that others might understand, not understand, especially in the culture. When your kids are hounding you with, well, everybody else is, you know, and, you know, and, and, and we're living with, with, in a culture that just doesn't understand morality anymore, or righteousness anymore, or goodness anymore. We're living in an age when, when, when like the NFL draft, the first homosexual player in the NFL draft to, to ever be openly confess he's, he's a homosexual is, is applauded for his integrity. Did you get that on film? That's the best I can do. When several years back, we have one president that tries to describe to us what is sexually immoral and what's not immoral, which influences a whole generation on that issue. And then another president who gets up and says, you know, uh, well, smoking dope's kind of like drinking beer. What planet are these people on? Whoever said getting drunk was good to start with. Must getting high. You know, I, I, I did all that for a little period of time, but I woke up one day and got saved. And so what a waste of it, wasted life is, you know, going home every day and soaking yourself in alcohol and smoking dope. It's a, that's a dead end road. But that's not the culture. I mean, we're legalizing it in every other state now. Because we, we've lost the concept of, of, of right and wrong and morality and immorality. You know, but we're used to homophobic. Listen, I'm not afraid of nothing. Come on. All right. We were... We were Trevor and I had some other teenage boys at the house yesterday and we were, we were working and doing some landscape stuff and moving rocks and stuff and Trevor and this another guy kept picking on the younger guy there throwing spiders and lizards at him because he was just terrified. You know? You know how teenage boys are. I tried not to laugh and tried to protect him, all right? But it was a bit funny. So we're sitting there sorting out all this stuff and he says to me, this young boy that's being traumatized, well, what are you afraid of? I said, I ain't afraid of nothing. So aren't you afraid of spiders? I said, no, I step on them. You afraid of lizard? I said, come on. I said, how about snakes? I said, I respect them. <laughs> he said, what are you afraid of? I said, Kathy. <laughs> and God. <laughs> where, where was I going with that? 
And that the culture, though, we don't know what to respect and what's right and what's wrong anymore. And it's not a matter of homophobia or any other kind of phobia. It's a matter of knowing where the lines are drawn according to the word of God. And just being willing enough to say, hey, I know I may be judged for this. I know I'm going to be slammed in the media for this. I know people are not going to understand. I know people are going to misconstrue everything I say. But this is what is right and this is what is wrong. And that's where Rahab comes. She came to that point. Go ahead. I'd I'd applaud if I were you. The next one, I don't she believe the judgment was coming. She made some choices. Her belief was made real and was proven by the fact of what she did. We know the scripture says faith without works is dead. It said in like manner was not Rahab the harlot justified by her works and that she received the messengers and sent them out another way. She made a decision. Again, it's a costly decision. It's a difficult decision, but she does what is right. You say, but she lied. Again, what do you expect from sinners? It was the thing to do for her at this moment. If she hadn't lied, I'm sure God would have protected them in some other fashion and delivered her in some other fashion. If, you know, if, if she'd gone another route in seeking to protect them, but she refused to serve man before God is what it gets down to. And as a Christian, and let me tell you, women, as a mother, there's gonna be lots of times you face that and have to cross that bridge. What does God want me to do here? Do I want to be, do I want to be popular with my children or do I want to be their mother? I want my, to my, to my children to be my best friend or do I need to be their mother and guide and guard and protect them? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have easily bent, bowed down at the golden altar that was built and, and, and the, the idol that was erected. Daniel could have easily said, you know, they don't want me to pray, I better not pray. The government says do this, then I, be, I, I better do that. If the government says don't do this, then I better not, I guess it's okay. And, and when do we ever let the government s- set the standards? And these are the things these men had to face and these people had to face. We Oh, our allegiance to God and to God first, period. That's it. And she chooses to say, I'm going to do what I know is the right thing to do, and, which is to honor God and give my allegiance to him, which led to the sixth thing. She stands alone. Nobody else in Jericho is making this stand but her. She stands alone. It's a difficult thing, is it not? It's a difficult thing as a mother to stand alone. There's a lot of choices you make that, that you just have to say, this is the way it is. But there's something that pulls and says, well, I know everybody else. Maybe I'll let them go. But you know in your spirit you shouldn't do something. But you just say, I'm going to stand on what I know is the right thing to do. And, you know, you're called terrible by your children. Someone say, I hate you. You hate me. All that stuff kids do, you know. And even though, you know, that's stupid and childish and ridiculous as they act that way, it still hurts. It still cuts to the core. It still bothers you. Because in your heart as a mother, there's something that drives you, one, to comfort, to encourage, to build those children's lives. And it's your desire to stay on a a plane and and a place with them where they're receiving that instruction. But you can't give in to what you know is wrong or what you know is harmful or you know what's going to deter their, their spiritual walk in life. She stands true to it. And there's those times you have to stand true, especially more so for you young mothers in this culture, raising your children right here, right now. How difficult is it going to be for you in the days ahead? But you have to go back and remember all those people in the Word of God, male and female, whether it's Noah, Abel, Enoch, Joseph, Moses, Gideon. I mean, look where they lived their lives in the pagan cultures and still, and still blossomed for the glory of God. You have to be the same way. She stood alone, and there will be times you have to stand alone. The seventh thing we learn from Rahab as she makes this pathway into virtue is, is that she sought for mercy. This is the, this is the bottom line key to all, because you can recognize your desperation and still not turn to God. She seeks God's mercy for herself and for her family. Out of her heart comes a compassion for those that she knows the closest and the dearest, and she's concerned for them. It, it's kind of like whatever it takes to, to bring deliverance. It's the same thing that Paul said over Israel. I wish that I myself were cursed for Israel's sake. And if it meant me going to hell to see them saved, then I'd do that. That's powerful, is it not? And I believe that also is something that beats in the heart of every mother. You know, I'll sacrifice myself. We know even as parents, men and women, as parents, when your children are hurting, you you say, God, can I take that for them? Can I handle that on their behalf? Can Can I suffer this for them? But you can't. But you can be there and serve as the model for someone who's been there and done that and paid the price and stood in the midst of the fire and walked with God. And so she seeks, she said, well, then you saved my, my family and my father, my, my mother and my household. 
And so she's interceding basically for them. And I believe that is one of the truest signs of any believer, but also especially of a godly mother who's willing to intercede, pray, seek God's face for your children. There's no way that you can be a mother, a parent in general, without prayer anymore. All right, it really never has been. We have to pray. We pray for our kids. All right? And I don't believe there's any place that that does stop. In fact, God just keeps adding to the prayer list. And we, then, they, then they get married. You've got to pray for a spouse. And then they have kids. And then they, those kids have kids. And, you know, my mother sat in here. She probably got, what, 60 kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids, and great-greats, you know. And some of you are in that same boat. You can't stop praying. I don't think I'd be able to remember their names, much less pray for them. <laughs> but that's the heart of the mother that intercedes and seeks for mercy and for grace and for redemption. That's the seventh thing. The eighth and the final thing is this. The redemption. The experiencing the grace of God. Now there are several things that when they had this conversation later in the chapter that, that she has to walk through. One, you know, she, has, she, she makes a deal, all right? She, she must not tell on them. She has to keep it a secret in regard to their being there. You know, she has to relate no longer to her interest here, but to the other's interest. That, that deals with just love for the brethren. That's part of the Christian life, is it not? Yes. Too often we're interested in what's best for me, putting me first. But that can't happen here. You know, and, and you know, boy, more than anybody else as women, you experience that on a daily basis many times. Putting others' interest above your own. I love that TV commercial I saw the other day. There's a guy sitting there and he's working on his computer or something and, and, and the note comes in and says, hey, Larry, or whatever his name was, do, do you remember that 37 hours of labor that your mother went through when you were born? He, oh, no. No, no. And the comment was, she does. <laughs> she does. Might be well to, 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 to acknowledge that. How many times have there been so many other laborious activities in the heart of a mother that just were difficult and hard? Hey, it's time to relate your love for them and it, because of their love for you. The second thing is, she must place this scarlet thread, this cord, whatever it was, as identification now. Uh, identification now that she's made a choice. When, the, when, when they begin to raid the city, they'll know where her house is. They've been given explicit orders not to destroy anybody in that location. I mean, an oath has been sealed by these guys. It's like a covenant relationship has been made. And all she has to do to avoid this coming judgment is to let this red scarlet cord out of the window. Now, I believe there's so much beauty and so much symbolism in that. You know, one is for them to have a scarlet colored garment, something has to die. They got the, the dye for these scarlet garments from grub worms. It'd be ground up. And that was the red dye number three or whatever of the day, okay? That's, that's where the red, red colors came from, through this process of, uh, of these worms. There was a crushing that would take place. Death would take place. Blood would be shed, all right? But that's, that scarlet thread is not just here, you know, in the book of Joshua. L let's back up and see it in type and symbol all the way into the very first book of the Bible when Adam and Eve come back and face to face with God, get right with God, and an animal is slain and blood is shed. Let's follow it now as we go into the wilderness with the tabernacle where blood is being shed and you see the scarlet running through there. You see the blood of, of the sacrifices. You see the, 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 the colors within the, the very tabernacle itself. Let's take it from there as we now have David uh, uh, putting up the, the funding for the, the, the temple that Solomon builds and you see the blood of thousands if not millions of animals being shed all this blood being shed representing the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins shall die. In other words, the only thing that's going to cover our sin, pay for our sin, redeem us from our sin, is blood. Let's take it all the way now as we follow it from Genesis into the Gospels where we see the Lord Jesus Christ who lays down his life for us and sheds his blood for us. That scarlet thread keeps coursing through the epistles as we see the cross being preached and unashamed to preach the cross. And right into the book, the final book of Revelation, where it says, and here comes Jesus riding on a white horse with his vesture dipped in blood. There we see that final cord come to its end. 
as Jesus Christ wears it with authority and dignity, declaring his lordship and slaying the Antichrist and becoming the king of the world and the universe. Hallelujah. That gave me chills. You ought to praise the Lord. (laughs) Identification. Our identity is found and wrapped up in that scarlet cord of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a great God we serve and what a great sacrifice for our sins. The third thing is she has to abide in her house. You wait here. We don't know how many days, weeks it might have been. How many hours it might have been. We don't know. But it represents separation. We, we are in this world, but we're not of it anymore. It doesn't mean that we isolate, but we insulate. We stay in Jesus. We walk with God. We choose to have integrity in our life. We choose to be that person of God. You choose to be that woman of God. And as you do that, that you're living that life of separation. You're always reaching out like the spies, going in, rescuing, on rescue operations, seeing people saved. But at the same time, we do not, we do not in any way devalue our commitment to Jesus Christ by embracing the world. We trust God. So now, as you look at Rahab, maybe you understand today that she really is a good picture for us to look at on Mother's Day. Look at the benefits of her faith. Very quickly, one, she perished not with them that believed, it says in Hebrews 11. That's a pretty good start right there. That's payday, amen? Because it came down heavy. The second thing is, in in, in Joshua 6, it says, and she dwelt in Israel the rest of her life. From being a heathen in Canaan to now being and finding a place no longer separated from the promises of God, but right in the midst of the promises of God in the congregation of Israel. The third thing is she becomes the honored wife of one of the princes of Judah, the mother of Boaz. In fact, she marries a guy named Salmon, who's the father. They get married and have Boaz. Well, you know the story of Ruth and Boaz and what a great man of integrity is. So she turns out to be a pretty good mama. I want to stop there just for a moment and say it again. She turns out to be a pretty good mama. What took her from being a harlot to a pretty good mama, to a great mother, to a woman of virtue, to produce somebody like Boaz, who later you see David comes out of that seed and later you see Jesus comes out of that seed. Because she did not let those things that were prior to her redemption cripple her any longer. She was free from those things. She was free from those sins and she didn't let those things dictate her life anymore. She chose to be the woman of virtue instead of the villainous person that she'd been. A new life. There's so many things that influence our lives from our past. We all, you know, every psychologist, every psychiatrist, every talk show on TV try to work out the social woes based upon where you've come from a difficult place. Well, who hasn't? Every one of us, in some shape, some form or another. But now what shapes us is not our past anymore. What's shaping our life now is the present work of God in our lives. All that's washed away under the blood of Jesus Christ. We have victory in Christ. She becomes a favorite ancestor in the house of Israel. God does exceeding, obviously, things, as the scripture said, above all, she can thank her ass. The third thing is she became the, the honored wife. Where am I? I'm on the fourth or five. Five, here we go. Five is she, God saw, she saw things, God do amazing things. The sixth thing is, She's delivered from the depths of sin and shame and elevated to the heights of glory and honor and dignity. I asked Kathy on the way over here, I wonder what Jesus says to Rahab when he sees her in heaven. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Mamma. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. What qualified her for heaven? What qualified her for such a place of dignity? Nothing. As she did. Everything that God did. God sent those spies in that city for her. They probably didn't even know that. How many times God's sending us to people we don't even know who they are? Or that God's even influencing them? For the women that are here today, those of us who are your children, say thank you. Honor you. And realize the tremendous sacrifice that you have made on so many different levels. And as your pastor, let me say, mothers, don't let anything from yesterday, from last month, last year, last decades, haunt your life another step. You've been redeemed. You're a child of the king. You belong to God. You're in his family now. You're one of his choice saints. You let God be God in your life and exalt himself in your life. Let God be glorified in your life.
Amen. I'm going to ask all moms just to stand up. Right? Just for a moment. We let you sit down a while ago. All moms just take a stand for a moment. Now, if your mom's around you, you can just reach over and put your hand on her because we're going to pray for her, all right? But I'd ask you just to bow your heads in this moment and thank God for your mom. You say, well, my mom's been all, gone to be with Jesus. Well, you can tell, ask Jesus to tell her Happy Mother's Day for you. Just say, Lord, mom's there with you. Tell her I love her today. If your mom's here, you just pray a prayer for her right now. Or if she's not here in the room, wherever she is, God's not separated by time and space like we are. He can reach down and touch her right now. Lord, we lift up these women who've been called to this, this place. It's, it's a very difficult position, a very difficult place in life. But yet it is such an honor to be called to that place. I pray for these mothers today, Lord Jesus, that some serving in roles of grandmas and great-grandmas now, that you would just bless their lives. Lord, more than anything else, with just a peace that, that can only come from you. The, the kind of grace that rests upon our life when we know that we've been delivered. We, we're, we belong to you. We're, we're in your kingdom now. We're, we're your children. The, the assurance of your mercy and your grace, just let it ring in their hearts and lives today. And God, as I look on this crowd today and I see so many godly women, I pray you increase their tribe, Father. Continue to raise up women who want to honor you. Lord, no matter if they've come from the depths like Rahab or from the back row of the church somewhere, draw them to yourself. Show us our first step is always humility, and then we can set out on the path. You tell us in Proverbs 31, a virtuous woman, her price is far above rubies. Lord, thank you for these virtuous women today. And may you be glorified in their lives. In Jesus' name. Somebody give them a round of applause. You may be seated. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you came to church today. And I really do want you to feel that when you walk.